weekend of short track racing as NASCAR heads to Richmond. We get you set with our DFS tiers and best bets. Buckle up, IBT family. It's the back road coming right at you. Right, and welcome down the back road, IBT Media's NASCAR DFS and betting program. Tonight, we break down Richmond, a track that has certainly grown on me the last couple of years as I've matured as a fan and a better. My name is Seth Wilcock. Tonight, I am joined by a NASCAR writer, editor, producer, graphic designer. You can find him at Rotoballer, FantasyGuru.com, and the Better Sports Network. He's Sean Engel. Sean, thanks so much for joining us, man. How are you tonight? I'm doing all right tonight, Seth. Uh, great to be here. Talk some NASCAR, be on the back road for the first time. Uh, it's quite exciting. And we got the action track this weekend, Richmond. We do, man. We do. So much history right here in Virginia. I'm excited to break it all down from a DFS and betting perspective with you. Sean, I, I know you from your father, Scott. He's a legend in the fantasy football community. So uh, cool to have a little crossover here and uh, cool to have a little, uh, you know, a, a little piece of uh, NASCAR history that we're going to talk about as well. So thanks for joining us, man. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself from, from a NASCAR perspective. Do you have any any favorite trends that, that you like to follow? Any any certain drivers that, that you keen in on uh, more weeks than not? So overall, uh, regarding the NASCAR trends, I've been doing NASCAR for a very, very long time as it is. But the trends, yeah, when you've been in NASCAR and studying it up long enough, you know that the trends never stay consistent for too, too long in this business. So. If there's one thing that, that uh, I usually keep an eye on, I keep an eye on how the drivers perform in recent races. I keep an eye on which manufacturers are performing well, which drivers do well with each of the different rules packages. And Certainly. overall, just know which drivers have a feel for the track, which ones don't, which ones could surprise and which ones don't. don't. So that's all that, that it comes down to it regarding uh, basic NASCAR info. Awesome. Awesome. Tonight, we're going to close the door on Coda, look back at the first road course of the season. We'll break down Richmond, and then we'll get into our DFS rankings and best bets. I want to shout out the IBT family. Thank you guys very much for all the support so far this month of May. April is going to be a really big uh, big month for us here on the channel. We got the Masters popping off, NFL draft content coming for you. And uh, Ellie and I will actually be at the track in Dover at the end of the month as well. So make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel, tuned in with us as we continue here on the background. We also have the NASCAR betting preview show on Wednesday night live with Derek and the boys. Um, what do you say, though, Sean? Should we go ahead and jump into it here, look back at Coda in the rear view? Yeah, let's get the engines revved up on this uh, next section and uh, look back. Let's do it. All right, man. So let's talk Coda. I always love Coda. It's the first road course of the season. I think it's a very unique track. It, it has elements of a newer road course. Still, though, kind of some of those elements of the traditional Watkins Glen and Sonoma. Corey Heim, he outlasts Ross Chastain. We saw some some uh, speed out of Connor Zilich, newcomer uh, in the truck qualifying. And then the Xfinity, probably the race of the weekend. SVG, Austin Hill, they leave the door open for Kyle Larson for a last lap pass. And then the cup race, William Byron takes a caution-free uh, cup race. Uh, second win of the season for Byron in that number 24 camp. What was your general uh, reaction to the weekend of racing down in Texas, Sean? I think overall, when it comes to Coda, it was a pretty interesting weekend. I'd say the truck race was about what you expected there. Corey yeah. Heim ended up uh, winning 
so forth. He just continues a crazy season where he's finished yeah. top five or six or better in just about every truck race so far in this year. He's got some crazy talent over there. But then you have to mention uh, Connor Zilich. He came back through the field several times after setback yes. after setback yes. with that Spire Motorsports truck. It, it, he had some speed within that truck. It only just makes me wonder: had the circumstances gone differently, could we could we have been talking about him maybe even competing against Heim for the win? That's just a what if to wonder. Regardless- there were some big numbers with Connor Zilich out in the streets too. I, I saw people getting on him at forty to one and and longer as well. So uh, it was a fun ride nonetheless. I think there in the trucks. Yeah, definitely for sure. And uh, it's interesting that how uh, this is now the first race where the uh, front row motorsports truck didn't win at Coda, too. Yeah, yeah. The number 38 car had a good run, Lance did, and uh, got bumped out there early. Uh how did you feel about Xfinity? That was kind of, it's always a crapshoot, I, I think, in that series when it comes to betting a little bit. I, I think we have a little more heavy leans this week. Uh, SVG gets disqualified the last lap. That saved my only Xfinity bet of the night. I had Ty Gibbs over him. So uh, thank you. I woke up the next day, Sean. I didn't even know that happened. I was like, wow, that's a, that's a little treat to start your Sunday. Wow. That, that was just a Pretty much they gave it to you right there just because he ended up cutting the corners on the final lap there. And it it would have been even more dramatic when you think about it, too. Imagine Larson didn't win this race, but SVG won, and then they say he's disqualified. And then Austin Hill would end up winning, or Larson instead. Yeah, that would be really dramatic. Don't fucking count out Austin Hill. That, that That's what I think we're continuing to learn five races into the Xfinity Series season. And then William Byron, he's someone we can't c- count out in Cup right now. I, I'll be honest, Sean, I got caught sleeping on William Byron. The, the number was long. Everyone was saying it early in the week. I was hammering down on Tyler Reddick. I couldn't look past the road course history in the next gen. I couldn't look past what he did at Coda, but William Byron had a ton of speed here in 2023. So we shouldn't have been surprised. Um, and, and what did you think overall about this performance on the road course, not just from Byron, but from the entire cup series, because caution free race, they're getting better at this track as we're learning, as we go ahead. Yep. Even though all the drivers have been getting better, there still was a, quite a few uh, penalties that were out on display for drivers still cutting the corners. I yeah. mean, we, we saw that with Chase Elliott when he was trying to regain control of his car. We so, saw that with a couple other different drivers. But then you also have to mention about not just William Byron and how dominant he was, but you also got to talk about Christopher Bell and that charge he tried throwing up with about 15 Yes, old. He was about like... Uh, 14, 13 seconds back, and he almost made up the entire difference by the the last lap, which is kind of crazy. If he had one more, would have been even more interesting, I say. I think he was going to get there. He was finally, you know, within what, what a, a second in that last corner. So it, it, super excited. And I, I was wish I was hoping he was going to get there. I had the Toyota uh, t- to win manufacturer bet there. Plus 140. I was riding that, hoping, hoping that he could get it done. He doesn't. Um, only really thing I got right last week, and I'll be honest, is I was on Ty Gibbs after practice and qualifying, hit the top three number on him. Alex Bowman. We put him on the thumbnail last week. We put him all across our socials last week. We loved Alex Bowman top 10. Should have got down on the top five. I looked at it a lot, especially as that number grew post practice and qualifying. I didn't go for it. So uh I'm licking my wounds a little bit here overall. Hoping I can get right here, heading into uh, Richmond here, Sean. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, Bowman, he had top five finishes in the last two races at Coda, and this one is just his third one in a row. So he just has a knack for this road course. And I've always thought he was a bit of an underrated road course racer. He's always had some solid results. But Coda, that's just his track. It is. It is, man. It doesn't matter where he is on the track. He's going to make his way forward. So uh, thank you, Alex Bowman, for being our, our, our saving grace last weekend that didn't make it an absolute wash. Uh, Sean, let's go ahead, though. Let's move forward. Let's talk about what is to come here this weekend in Horizon Forecast and uh, break down Richmond. Hey, Michael, it was only 20 percent chance of rain. I think we got all 20. All right. So I talked about it in the intro, Sean. Richmond was a track when I grew up. I think I always kind of just, 
I don't know. I, I tuned it out a little bit. I didn't love Richmond. We especially got some snoozers there in like the late 2010s, early 2020s. Um, but Richmond, it, it's been a really good race the last couple of years uh, when the Cup Series has been there. It's a shorter flat track with higher tire wear. And uh, the comp tracks that we can also be looking at here for Richmond, uh, we at least have one under our belt this season with Phoenix. Um, then we can also be looking back at Gateway a little bit here in 2023, New Hampshire in 2023 as well. Those are the primary comps for me. You can look at Martinsville a little bit, I think, as well. Um, but Gateway, Richmond, and Phoenix, that's where I primarily waited here in my model this week. Sean, is there another track I'm missing? Well, I think those are all good comparable tracks in order to base the data off of. But I did want to also mention this, that we did also t experience a short track race where tire wear was a big concern, too. And that was yeah. Bristol, as we know. And we got to take some notes from there, even though it's an entirely different track type. I mean, well, it's similar, but different, you could say. Yeah. But still, we can base some of our notes regarding how drivers were able to handle tire wear from Bristol, and that could apply towards this race at Richmond as well. And I think tire wear is going to be the buzzword all weekend, Sean, because we saw so much of it, an unprecedented amount at Bristol. So I, I think you're right. I think Bristol probably should at least, like, you can look at the results. You know, I, I might not look at the pure speed, but when I'm looking at, hey, who were the drivers who were able to save their stuff the best uh, and get to the end of that race? Well, we know who it was. It was Denny Hamlin, Martin Truex Jr. We'll talk about them here a little bit later. Uh, we got Lana in the chat. What's up, Lana? Thanks so much for tuning in with us tonight. We appreciate you, um, as always, here on the back road. And schedule for this weekend, Sean, looks like Saturday morning. We're going to get 10 a.m. wake up with uh, some A and B practice, 20-minute sessions, trucks going or uh, Xfinity going off later in the afternoon and then the cup race will be on sunday we got stage breaks uh oh man i actually did not update my stage breaks i apologize there what are we looking at for stage breaks here i know we're going 400 laps here um all right we'll we'll, we'll come back to it we'll come back to the stage breaks um some trends i do want to have us keep in mind as well here um qualifying canceled last year i've seen a lot of people out there trying to say hey this guy qualified well last year it was rained out it was go going off the grid so uh don't weigh that too much here this week and then the last time jgr won the poll here was in 2017 i think that's something to keep in mind sean because i know we're all excited about joe gibbs racing and toyota specifically but i don't think they'll be on the poll but does that matter to you this week? Because we have seen a lot of these winners come from somewhere around the seventh, eighth, uh, and ninth place the last couple of years. Well, qualifying, it is going to matter because it's a short track. And with short tracks, ultimately, drivers are going to need to do more work in, in order to make more passes when you go for, forth and you start from, say, the middle part of the pack or the rear the field but it has been shown and phoenix was an example of this where if you do have a good enough car though you are going to be able to march your way to the front we saw that with christopher bell at phoenix ultimately and i yeah. think that's going to come into play as well you even look back towards the very last race at richmond in july last year some of the drivers that ended up leading the most laps did not even start from the pole position in fact actually the winner who led eight, 88 laps during that July race was Chris Bush or his starting Bush, position yeah. was 26th. Crazy. There. Yeah. Yeah. Th this, this is one of those tracks. We usually see a surprise driver or two kind of march through the field. Um, and the winners only come from the top 10 overall at this race, 76% of the time, which is close to average. Um, but only from the front row, which is 28% of the time, which is definitely a little bit below average, especially at some of these places like Phoenix, where it's a comp track, but track position matters so much more at Phoenix. And I think it does here at Richmond, they can fan out a little bit more and, uh, you definitely see a little bit more green flag passing here, um, down in Virginia, Four different teams have won in the next-gen era, SHR, Joe Gibbs Race, and Hendrick, and RFK. So, again, I know we're really excited to go out and bet the farm on the Toyotas this week, Sean, but we have to keep in mind, Hendrick has some pedigree here, as does RFK. 
Oh, for sure. Especially when you mentioned about Hendrick, Larson and Byron, they're two two of the drivers that I have my eye on already this week, just because Larson is one of the more recent winners at the track. And this and also in this exact race one year ago, Byron led over a hundred laps. So we have to keep that in mind too. That that 2014, they've been showing that they've been having speed no matter what the track type is this season, just like last year. So those two in particular, we have to keep our eye on. And RFK, they've been great on the short tracks within the past year or so. So another team to also really watch for. William Byron will be up there as long as a fucking silver bullet doesn't get in his way this this uh, th- this week here, Sean. Um, let's get to the iFantasyRace.com's asterisk mark driver of the week. If you guys haven't checked out iFantasyRace.com yet, please head over to their website. This is where we're getting a lot of data here for our handicapping. Uh, myself uses this. Our entire staff here at IBT Media uses this. I know a lot of other folks in the industry use it as well. You get everything from his total speed rankings that is a custom iFancy metric, or you can just get you know your basic loop data there, and also everything like to the schedule events as well. So make sure you're checking out iFancyRace.com. Uh, Ryan is telling us that Tyler Reddick, uh, was actually really good here last summer. Uh, Performance-wise, he was top three, but finished 16th uh, in that race, started on the pole, led 81 laps, won stage one, finished third in stage two, and uh, and then lap 330, running second place, got into a pit road violation and uh, ends up messing everything up for him. Disappointing day from Tyler Reddick back there in the fall. And it kind of sounds like Phoenix earlier this year as well, Sean. Like there was a legitimate time in that race where like, God damn, Tyler Reddick's the fastest car here early on. Does this make you have any interest in Tyler Reddick? I haven't found a way to get him on the betting card yet, but he was one of my initial thoughts when I was looking even at the Phoenix data from this year as well. So when it comes to Tyler Reddick, he is in a Toyota. And Toyota, I have a pretty strong feeling that they are going to be the manufacturer to beat this weekend just based on recent history because they've just been dominant, leading laps, getting their drivers competitive for the win. But Tyler Reddick is one of those few drivers that just hasn't really been competitive that much in past races at Richmond. The very last race at Richmond was the very first time that he ever yeah. led laps at the track. It, yeah. And he still has not even scored a top 10 finish in his entire cup career. Wow. The track so far. Wow. Okay. Wow. I'm, I'm glad you're throwing out some overall driver history. I think sometimes I get so locked into the next gen and to the last couple of, uh, of starts here. And I don't look at it holistically like, damn, Tyler Reddick's kind of never really been that great here. Um, he's going to have the, the, the short run speed. We know he has all season long. Um, it's just, can he sustain that and get the finish he deserves? He's always a tricky, a tr- tricky bastard when it comes to DFS lineups. I usually don't play him in, in cash games, um, and I probably won't this week either. But like in my fan track season league, league uh, season long league, I might be throwing him out there. And maybe if we get some uh, plus money matchups here on Sunday, I could as well. Um, let's go ahead though, Sean. Let's break this race down a little bit further. Uh, driver specifically here in tire tiers. All right, let's do. It. All right, welcome to the tire tiers. We're going to rank this from a DFS perspective, and we're looking at DraftKings and fan track salary here. Sean, I'm going to give you the floor to start here. Who is your 101? Who is your top driver this week that you're making sure he is in your fantasy NASCAR lineups? Well, the top driver, and so far the driver that I think is the most likely to win is Denny Hamlin, that number 11 car. This is one of Hamlin's best tracks in the entire Cup Series based on on his overall history. He's the only driver in the past six Richmond races to to finish, have five or more top five finishes. Wow. And he also has a win within that span, too. He's also, uh, let's see here, looking back at the uh, past nine races, he only has two finishes outside of the top ten, and he's also led in each of the last seven Richmond races. This is just Hamlin's track, bar none. We already know he's good on the short tracks. He was very good at Phoenix early in the year. He won at Bristol. Give me that number 11 as one of the top drivers to watch this weekend as a favorite to win. 
Yeah, Denny Hamlin was jumping all over my models when we were at Bristol a couple weeks ago, and I didn't want to pay the, the price. I didn't want to put him in my lineups. I faded him a bit, and I won't make that mistake again this week, Sean. You're dead on with me. If I'm paying up for someone on DraftKings 11-2, it's going to be Denny Hamlin for me this week. Um, I'll go Martin Truex Jr. I'll put him on the board. I, I know we like Denny a lot, but... I will do whatever I can to also make sure I have at least some exposure to Martin Truex Jr. in DFS lineups this week. I know his overall Richmond stats aren't quite as good as Denny, but they're still one of the better Cup Series drivers here. And when you look specifically here uh, in the next-gen era, still top 10 in those uh, total speed rankings. And then also, I like what he did at Phoenix. He was number two in the total speed rankings at Phoenix. We also saw if tire wear comes into to play, Martin Truex Jr., he's one of the veterans. He knows how to get it done. We saw that at Bristol. I like the form he's coming into here. Uh, Sh Sean, give me a little Martin Truex Jr. love here in the A tier. I have to agree with you with Truex being up there for me too. In fact, I'd say he's probably my third favorite driver of the week overall. He's, okay. He's finished 11th or better in each of the last 10 Richmond races, and he's led in five of the last six. This is a track where Truex has been very good. He's won at this track multiple times. Overall, and you have to remember, too, those Gibbs cars, they've been the class of the field when it comes to both Phoenix and Bristol. they This has just been a Toyota playground when it comes to leading laps. You got to like Truex. I just don't think that the number 19 team has as much speed consistently as, say, mm -hmm. the 11 team or the 20 team this year. But he's he's pretty close right there with them, I'd say. Absolutely. Who else do you think uh, belongs in this A tier? It sounds like there's someone you would almost me maybe even argue that goes above Truex in your rankings. Yeah, the number 20, Christopher Bell. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little leeway here, Sean. We'll put we'll put we'll put Christopher Bell in that two hole for you as well. Oh, definitely for sure. And just overall, Bell's been really good at this track as well. He's led in three of the last five Richmond races, and he also ha has five finishes of sixth or better at this track in seven starts overall, Seth. Oh, geez, dude. I Chris Bell, he is another guy I just can't get right for whatever reason. I was on him one week before Phoenix, should have been on him at Phoenix, and I think this guy has shown that he is legitimate at this track. He's legitimate here on these shorter flat tracks. So I don't mind Christopher Bell at all. Um, you know, I, I figured this is how the show would start here with these Joe Gibbs racing cars out in front. I will go with my guy just to mix it up because I think he belongs here and he's underrated and, and no one's talking about him this week. Although he just won last week, Sean. Give me William Byron in that number 24 car. Byron overall has been just an absolute clinic this season so far, specifically at Richmond. Like he doesn't have the greatest finishes the last season, but still uh, average start of 3.75 in the next gen era. That's the best in the field. You know, he's going to start towards the top. So might not have a, a ton of differential points uh, available to him, but led 117 laps last year at this track finish. P1 in that first stage, P3 in the second stage. He's just got to get to the end of it, man. He's got one of the best pit crews out there as well. So give me uh, William Byron and a little bit of a discount at 10.5 compared to some of these higher Joe Gibbs racing Toyotas. I think if I'm going to pick a Chevy driver to be my favorite Chevy this week, I think it is going to be Byron. Just because he, even though he does, like you said, he doesn't have the finishes exactly to show for it, but he's also been quite, quite good at this track, especially in the April Richmond races in particular, yes. just because he's led over 100 laps in the last two April Richmond races. That 2014 just has speed every single track. You, you got to put him pretty high up there, I'd say, too. Lana saying Bush may turn Christopher Bell. Yeah, man, a little bit of beef here between uh, Kyle Bush and Christopher Bell. Richmond, usually a pretty clean race. Usually a pretty clean race. We usually see most of the drivers get pretty deep into this thing. So hopefully we don't see that happen. But definitely something I, I think to handicap a little bit into your decisions moving forward that uh, maybe some people not so happy with, with Christopher Bell out there. Sean, who else belongs here in this A tier? I could maybe make the argument. We talked about him earlier. Tyler Reddick has shown a lot of speed. Um, 
at, at Phoenix, he's shown a lot of speed in this, uh, it, not at this race specifically, but at this track in the fall. Tyler Reddick, 8,700. I think he's a nice little leverage play, but you always risk getting some negative points with Tyler Reddick. Oh, for sure. Just because uh, the potential qualifying speed could be pretty high up there. And considering the track history, yeah, I'm not 100% sold on Reddick being, say, yeah. an A-tier driver, but I could see him comfortably maybe towards like the middle of B-tier for me. Okay. Yeah, we'll throw him down there. Is there anyone else you think belongs in this uh, in this A-tier for you? I'd say if anything, I'm right now uh, saying that I think that's just about everybody. There's some okay. drivers that I think are pretty close. They're kind of on the line in between A and B for me. But overall, if we're going to have four, those are the four that I like there. Okay. Who do you like for the B tier? Overall, uh, for the B tier, you got to also input the RFK cars, Brad Keselowski and Chris Buescher. Both of those drivers have been very good, in particular with the short tracks. Brad, he led a lot of laps in this race in July last year. And Chris Buescher, he is one of the most recent winners at this track. RFK, more than the other four teams, just has found something on short tracks and shorter tracks in particular. You got to like them a lot this week. And if they show speed during practice, watch out. Chris Busher's ripping it right now. He has three straight top tens coming into this race. I should have been on the plus money top 10 on him at Coda last week. I like Busher a lot, man. He's really good at these shorter flats. So I'm with you there. I think you're spot on there, Sean. Um, I'd like to throw Ty Gibbs in this tier as well. I, I think Ty Gibbs is going to be a factor. He's starting to finally get up there in price on DraftKings, Sean. We're, we're seeing him right around that, that 10K flat range. We've been getting discounts on him all season. Uh, right now, man, Ty Gibbs, well above everyone in the most fancy points per race, 53.6. The kid is on a fucking heater, man. You've had to have him in your lineup the last couple weeks if you wanted to have that optimal lineup. I think Ty Gibbs here, he got ninth last season. We don't have a lot of Cup Series history with him. Um, however, we also know this, a kid who won this race in the Xfinity series, not that long ago as well. So give me some tie gives, man. He, he's just improved so fast. Looks so impressive all season. Sean, how can you not love what the number 54 car is doing right now? Oh, absolutely. I have to a hundred percent agree with you there, Seth. Ty Gibbs, this kid is really really showcasing why he was good as he was in the Xfinity series, his sophomore season. And he already right now through, through the first six races has the best average finish of all drivers in the cup series. 7.8. Yeah. He, he he's, he's been arguably the best driver without a win this season. I would say so. Maybe it comes here. Uh, Sean, who else goes in the B tier for you? I think we still have a couple heavy hitters that should be considered. Oh, definitely, for sure. Uh, one of those drivers that I'm already considering for that is the number one of Ross Chastain. Ross is a driver that you wouldn't expect in order to be exactly a great driver at this track, considering his history. But he has led in three of the last five Richmond races. He also has two top ten finishes within that span as well. And Trackhouse, they're another team that's been pretty good, good when it comes to these shorter tracks as well. And also, let's not forget, too, out of all the Chevy drivers at Phoenix, the best placing one was Ross Chastain, and he was the only one to finish inside the top 10. Yeah, man, I, I, I'm on board with Ross Chastain here once again. Another guy who's just pulling off some really good finishes right now. Multiple top 10 so far this season. I like what Ross is putting out there. Uh, he's found that consistency again that we saw early last season and towards the latter half of the year as well. So I like Ross Chastain. We're going to throw Kyle Larson up just for some housekeeping as well, I think. Um, Larson, man, like he's he's a little overpriced for me this week. I don't think I'll have a lar lot of Larson at 10-2. Um, but still a, a threat to be that top Chevy. If it's not Byron this week, it probably is Kyle Larson, I think, here. Um, won this race last season. Wasn't the best car, but still was leading some laps here. And uh, about a top five car on those shorter flat tracks overall. So give me a little bit of Kyle Larson here at the end of the A tier. And the only other person I could maybe consider here, Sean, would potentially be uh, Ryan Blaney. He, he, he's shown speed at different times on the shorter flat tracks. Um, top three in the total speed rankings over there at iFantasyRace.com. 
However, he hasn't been as good recently, I feel like, at, at Richmond. As far as Ryan Blaney is concerned, he's kind of on that line between B and C for me, I'd say. Okay. Just because, ultimately, he hasn't had too many standout runs when it comes to his track history. Although he has led in three of the last four races, and he does have two top ten finishes within that span. I think, ultimately... It's going to be really dependent on uh, where he qualifies and how good his car is in practice. I'd say I'm going to lead him over into B just because out of all the four drivers, he is one of the better choices and he's been more consistent than a lot of them this season. But he's probably the last driver I'd stick on to B. Okay. All right. I will throw Joey Logano in C's. And listen, there's a lot of fucking love right now on the internet for Joey Logano. People are calling out his top 10 number all week. I've been seeing it go from like plus 120. It's like minus 120 right now. And Sean, we're part of the problem here at In Between Media. We had an article come out today. Our guy Ozzy, our prop specialist, he is on the top 10 for Logano, of course. And, you know, he's deserved it, man. Logano's ran good here at Richmond in the past. I just worry that we haven't really seen the speed as of lately from Joey Logano, uh, specifically at Phoenix, where it's 25th in the total speed rankings, kind of an abysmal day. So I think there's a lot more risk with uh, Joey Logano than people are leading on here, man. Like you are getting a little bit of a discount at 8,400, but like Brad's 8,200, Ross is 8,500 on DraftKings. There's no fucking way I'm playing Joey Logano. Like, I get the hype trains moving right now, but I got to hit the brakes here, Sean. Yeah, out of all the tracks where I'm considering Logano, uh, a shorter track where the rules package just th – that t number 22 team just has not figured out the speed on it yet. I'm not really going to be rostering him in a lot of my lineups this week as a result unless they somehow get it turned around or if he qualifies deep enough in the field where yeah. he can just get the place differential to make it back up for, say, at least the top 20, top 15. Yeah, and, and let's not forget, man, he's averaging like 15 DraftKings points per race right now. It's been brutal if you've been playing Joey Logano. I can't trust it quite yet. Is there anyone you can trust here in the C tier, Sean? Absolutely. In fact, actually, I'm going to say that one team that I think people should watch a little more this weekend that people aren't talking about enough, especially at short tracks, is Stuart Haas Racing. And in particular, there's two drivers in mind yeah. that are priced very well, can deliver similar levels of performance, and that's Josh Berry and Chase Briscoe. Josh Berry, you have to remember, he's with that number four team. They won at this track before recently yep. with Kevin Harvick. Yep. And on top of that, Josh Berry looked very good, led laps at Bristol overall. And as for Briscoe, he's the sort of driver that's quietly pu putting on a lot of top 15 performances and sneaking his way into the top 10 a lot. And for a track like Richmond, where you can get a Briscoe that might not exactly qualify that well. Qualifying hasn't exactly been a strong suit this year, but uh, it's definitely been uh, very nice to have him in DFS lineups, that's for sure. And I think he can put on another solid, capable performance this week. Yeah, I, I think the SHR callout is well warranted here. Um, I'll just make quick work of Ryan Priest. I think he's a D still for me. But if I need um, some chalk, I think it's going to be chalky because people know that Ryan Priest is a good short track racer. Uh, finished fifth here in the, in the I, I keep calling it the fall, but it really was the summer race, the July Richmond race, and then 18th in the spring race. And when you look back at Phoenix as well, top 12 in total speed rankings there at our uh, most recent comp race, as well so i like ryan priest a little bit as a leverage option here um and, and bubba wallace i think bubba wallace is a c tier here for me listen we like toyota he's in good ass equipment we know that sean and, and he's continuing to get better here at the short tracks when i watched back that uh that july race he he was out there with reddick at one point leading laps of course he comes down pit road he has a slow stop i didn't i don't think they got the tire off um in time and that kind of killed his day but Bobo Wall is getting better at Richmond, getting better at these shorter flags as we as we continue to progress throughout his career. 
Yeah, he's been showing consistent improvement year over year. Even if he didn't win a race last year, he still had his best average fit finish of his career last year. And ultimately, he's just been getting better and better at these short tracks, especially with 2311 catching up in the equipment to Gibbs a little bit. I don't think they're quite there yet, but I think they're ca catching them right now. And as far as Bubba is concerned, I think C tier is a perfect spot yeah. because even though... The, the track history has not indicated that Bubba's going to do well. He's never scored a top 10 finish at Richmond, but he did match his career best finish in the July race at 12th. So ultimately, if he ends up qualifying a little bit deeper into the field, I have my eye on him, and I think that's a perfect tier to put him in. Yeah, man. Bubba Wallace, like getting him down at 7,600. That's, you know, right in that range of Briscoe, Barry. Um, and also Alex Bowman. Any Alex Bowman love for you this week? He's won here before. We can't discount that. And finally, kind of on, on the right path, it seems like. Finally showed some speed last week. Has a couple top 10s on the season so far. And just kind of like an average guy on, on these shorter flat tracks, 18th in the total speed rankings that are combining the, the uh, 2023 and Phoenix uh, total speed rankings over there. But yeah, like I'm all right with Bowman this week. Like if I need some salary relief, uh, eight, eight flat for me, I'll take it. Yeah. I think Bowman, he's shown some good history at Richmond before. He's a former winner at this track. Hendrick Motorsports, of course, you have to keep that in mind. The equipment is going to be good. Yeah. Ultimately, it's just going to be a matter of qualifying practice to see if the team nails the setup. Because if the team nails the setup, the team is good. But if the team doesn't nail the setup, then you're not going to be hearing much from Bowman during the race. It could go either way yeah. with them. And that 48 team, they've been hit or miss with that, especially dating back to last year. Is there anyone else that you can make the argument for a C tier here? Because man, I feel like we just hit, hit hit a tier break, man. Like there's not a lot left on the board that I like. There's a couple of drivers. I think I'll get some hate mail if I don't include them in the C tier, but I don't know if they truly deserve it. Ultimately, I think we have to include uh, Kyle Busch and Chase Elliott in this tier as well. Just be We haven't talked about them much yet, but uh, Kyle Busch, this is a really good track for him historically. And he also di did end up finishing inside the top 10 during the July la race last year, driving for RCR. My only reason for not putting him up higher would be probably just because that RCR team, they've been hit or miss when it comes to the setups. And so far throughout the two short track events that we've had at Phoenix and Bristol, they've missed the setups really. But Bush has so much talent. He's been so good at this track that you kind of can't fully ignore him. And uh, you could say the same thing about Elliot, although Elliot, I'd say, has been a little bit more consistent than Bush overall to start the year. And, you know, you got that Hendrick Motorsports equipment as well. So this could play a hand into Elliot maybe being one of those sneaky drivers that people... You know, people are going to think about him a lot just because of the name recognition and the equipment, of course. But DFS players who may not have been on him every week, he could be a sneaky play. Yeah, it's interesting with Chase Elliott. I loved his recent interview when he kind of talked about, hey, uh, I don't really know. How, not that he doesn't know how to drive these cars, but he's kind of having to relearn how to drive these cars at an elite level. Um, because even though he won five races in the next gen era in 2022, like the car is very much different now than it was at that point. And like all the drivers are nailing their setup. So it's really coming down to skill where I feel like in that 2022 season, a lot of times, like usually the fastest car was winning a lot in that season. Um, so I don't mind chase Elliott. It, it's really hard to like nine, nine flat, nine flats, a tough price for me, Sean. Like I'll be honest, bro. Give me, Give me Reddick eight seven eight five for Jastain, like eight two for Brad. Like that's why I think Elliot's in the right place here, uh, right at the end of the seas. Yeah, and especially when you look back towards uh, his finishing history, he's finished top fifteen or better in the last eleven races. But in eat, but in the uh, two of the last three, uh, actually the last two. Richmond races within the spring he's finished 14th and 12th so he yeah. hasn't exactly been lighting yeah. the world on fire there yeah no I feel you there um all right I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll throw JHN here uh in, in driver D tier man I mean 
hell of a fucking season for JHN right now. Still hanging on to a playoff spot right now, dude. Averaging 36.5 DraftKings points per week, man. And also, like, let's not forget, this guy has been really, really good here and in an Xfinity car the last couple of years. We don't have a lot of cup history for him here at Richmond, but he's been a top three contender multiple times the last few years here down in Virginia. So give me some JHN, dude. Like, he's been a Hail Mary for me uh, and just always coming through, never leaving you with negative points. And let's also not forget, he did win at Richmond before in a truck before yes. so that's yes. also something to mention too and he did also finish sixth at bristol let's not forget that either yeah yeah and dude. also legacy motor club toyota there's a lot of factors to say that nema even though he doesn't have a lot of cup history at this track i think he's one of the value drivers that people really should consider this week absolutely yeah i'll be hammering him fucking hard um where else we go in here sean where else are we looking here uh like i'm seeing a couple fast cars on the board like we still got a toyota out there that should maybe be mentioned we got danny suarez still sitting out there on the pine as well so looking towards the next couple of drivers this is where it starts to get a little bit trickier to sort out but yeah. ultimately i'm going to say that that uh, you should definitely have Noah Gregson up there too, just because the SHR cars, they, they've they been good on these shorter tracks. And although Noah doesn't really have the history or the experience as much as, say, the other three drivers when it comes to short tracks, that 10 car has been outperforming expectations yeah. this year. And we have to really pay attention to that, especially if they nail the setup. He's going to be a real sneaky value in that regard there too. Yeah, let's not forget Noah Gragson, seventh in the NASCAR total speed rankings here uh, at Phoenix earlier this season, one of our best comp tracks. And also Noah Gragson, man, like he's in this number 10 car. I know it's a different driver, but Eric Almarola always came to play at Richmond, always came to play these shorter flat tracks, kind of the king of them, really. So I'm excited to see what Gragson can do. Um, yeah, I I'll go ahead and throw Austin Dillon up here. Like, Austin Dillon weirdly is kind of fucking decent at Richmond. Like it's one of those like weirdly good tracks for him. I mean, just been absolute dog shit all year, Sean, if I'm, if I'm going to be straight with you, but finished ninth year in the fall, um, f finished 25th in this race last year. Going back though, has a 16th, a 10th an 11th, a 10th. Like he's up there, man. A a a D a D really likes this track a little bit. Yeah, it's a track that ends up fitting with his driving style a little bit. And although he hasn't been impressive this season, as he only has one top 20 finish throughout the whole year, and that being at Las Vegas, he still is a driver that I think we can keep an eye on based on the history. And he also scored positive place differential in two of the last four races this season. So oh, yeah. Austin Dillon, RCR, it's better equipment, you can argue, than a lot of these drivers. Uh, teams are far down, down within this range too yeah dude the equipment is so like especially when you look at how those xfinity drivers are running their equipment it's like damn austin austin dylan's seat would be so hot if it, he wasn't you know the, the grandchild man um let's throw danny suarez here too sean just you know i don't think we need to touch much on him but top 25 in the total next gen total speed rankings here at richmond so i think he deserves a little bit of love um anyone else you can make the case here for the d tier ultimately looking at these next last couple of drivers you can make an argument say for michael mcdowell you can make an argument for carson hosevar as well and also Justin Haley, I'd say, even though this one is a bit of an interesting call too. But that 51, I think that 51 is better than what people make it out to be, especially as we see within the last two weeks or so. Dude, Justin Haley like always just gets fucked up. Like, didn't he get disqualified again this last weekend or something? Yeah, he got disqualified at Coda because his car failed post-race inspection where it didn't meet the minimum ride height. Dude, Justin Haley, man, every like he's just getting burned. Every, like that's that's like what you're kind of going against here is is that Justin Haley could have some bullshit like that happen once again. But if it doesn't like uh, he's not the worst guy here, honestly, like you look at his finishes. Uh, actually, they're pretty dog shit. I, I mean, they're, <laughs> I'm going to be uh, Yeah, his speed rankings, not terrible, but but the finishes ain't bad. Uh, looks like we got we got Tino in the chat. What's up, Tino? Good to see you, man. Tino killed it yesterday on the NASCAR betting preview show. Good to have him in the chat tonight. We appreciate you, man. Um, all right, let's drop to F. 
throw throw Eric Jones here. He's in a Toyota. That's all you can really say about Eric Jones right now. Ricky Stenhouse, um, outproven his price every single week. He did it last week at Coda a little bit as well. So um, anyone else you can even put on the board. We don't have to rank them all. Keep that in mind. We don't have to rank them all. Some guys remain unranked um, if they truly, truly are uh, deserving of it. I'm going to say that we definitely should put Daniel Hemrick up there just based on his Xfinity series history alone. Good point. And he, he's the dr- driver that I'd say he call it racing. They may not have hit it on the equipment as much this year compared to l- past years, but he's the sort of driver that if he ends up qualifying deep and far enough, you're going to want him in your lineup. Ju- and especially considering on DraftKings, he's the cheapest driver of the week too. Yeah, he shouldn't be lower than Kaz Grala, probably, or Harrison Burton. Let's be, or Ty Dillon. Y- you are right. That is a misprice, Sean. I-, I I like the call out there. I'm the first one to take shots at colleague because, I mean, let's just be honest. Like, what are you doing with Ty Dillon the 16? Like, there are I could name 30 other drivers I would rather see in that car more deserving of that ride this weekend than Ty Dillon. Like, what are you doing? colleague man like it honestly it pisses me off to be honest because now people are gonna have to drive around him and he's gonna get loose and he's gonna take out Danny Hamlin or something when we're on the outright so um not thrilled with that decision not thrilled with colleague but Daniel Hemrick at five it flat is a misprice but I will say this about Ty Dillon he ends up qualifying far back enough though he can yeah, actually it. be worth while in the sense that that his history even though he doesn't have the finishes to show for it you look back towards each of his last four races at Richmond, positive place differential every time. Something to keep in mind. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. Oh, terrible, terrible. We're, we're in the Ty Dillon segment of the show. I don't really, I don't know. Can we rank Austin Cindric, man? He's been he's been pretty bad at Richmond, too. Yeah, he's not a driver I'm really on this week. The only other one that I'd say I'm even considering to maybe put up there is Todd Gilliland, just because the front row motorsports equipment has been yeah. fair and solid enough. And Gilliland, he did score a top 20 finish at this track before within four starts. So he does prove that he can fin- finish if he actually has the circumstances go his way and that we have to remember front row motorsports their equipment got an upgrade overall this year because they have that team penske alliance now so they get some of the same information that ryan blaney or joey logano get yeah yeah i'm with you there man uh cory lejoy i'm not gonna rank him this is like he is so bad here like it's terrible 32nd 21st 28 31 29 like you're better off taking the shot at Daniel Hemrick at 5,000 than honestly paying 700 more for the joy. So uh, Zane Smith, man, just been a tough year for Zane. Like we know this kid's a talented driver and like, I don't think it's the worst equipment. Spire's equipment hasn't been terrible this year. Just a lot of bad luck for Zane. Hopefully he adjusts here quickly and Kaz Grala, man, like hey, shout out Kaz, dude. Like he's at least run respectable. Like he hasn't killed you. He's had like, actually three like 40 point games here uh on DraftKings this year so like shout out Kaz Grala. how about it Sean how about it Kaz Grala, he's one of those drivers that uh if he qualifies deep enough he's gonna end up paying off for your lineup right there and he's done that all throughout this season so far I couldn't even find any Kaz Grala stats so I was honestly like looking at some crazy just like long ass shot top tens just to see and I was looking for Kaz Grala, uh Richmond stats. Couldn't even find him. I don't think he's been here in the Cup Series at all yet. Um, Not didn't, at all. Yeah, didn't feel like looking back at Xfinity or, or Trucks. So, um, but yeah. It's crazy, but, though, because I was able to find his Xfinity stats. He has five starts at this track, three okay. top ten finishes. Oh, oh, Kaz Grala. And a top 15 within that that span as well. So we're ranking him. We're throwing him on the board. We're out baby. of five starts in the Xfinity series. He's been top 15 or better with three top uh-huh. tens. All right. Kaz Grawl is on the board. You talked me into it. All right. Um, all right. So that's going to be our DFS tiers for the week. I'll put out a, a, an article on the website about it tomorrow. Um, Sean, let's go ahead. Let's round out the show, though, with a little parking garage props. Let's do it. All right.
right, Sean? So definitely a different approach to the betting markets this week. A lot of our usual plus money top 10s, not an option this week. The top five market, even quite a bit juiced. And I don't like a lot of the matchups I'm seeing pre-practice and qualifying. That being said, though, there is still some value, I think, in some of these other markets that we don't consider a lot. What was your overall impressions of what the sportsbooks offered our NASCAR betters this week? Ultimately, I think that some of the bets out there can be favorable or hit, but there's not a lot that's overly impressing me so far this week, unless you want to call some of the long shot winner bets, for for example. Yeah, yeah. I I actually, I really like Xfinity this week. I think Xfinity, I almost feel more confident in, which I'm just learning the ropes in Xfinity betting. I'm going to be honest. I'm a newer Xfinity better. I've been betting cup for a long time and I'm dipping my toes in the Xfinity streets. And I feel good this week. We'll, we'll talk about Xfinity later in the show. Let's talk about the outright market though, Sean. Um, where do, where do you want to go? My, my thought process, especially with a lot of these Toyota drivers going to be in that B qualifying is that there was only one Toyota that I felt confident to get down pre-practice and qualifying that I thought the price would be cut down more. I like Martin Truex Jr. I like Ty Gibbs. I like Reddick, but I ultimately think they might be just as good of a value, if not better of value after practice and qualifying. Was there anything pre-practice and qualifying specifically on the Toyotas you liked in the outright market? As far as outrights are concerned, the one that I may take a chance on as far as odds are alone is at least Ty Gibbs at plus 900, just because yeah. JGR, as we know, they're they're the team that I think they're go- you're going to have to beat in order to really win this race. Sure, you have Bell at plus 500 or Hamlin at plus 500 and Truex is at plus 650. I think all three of those drivers are definitely in the conversation to win the race this weekend. Yeah. But Gibbs is not in the conversation as much just because you can say he doesn't have as much experience as the other three. Or or the fact of the matter is, is that 50-14 just hasn't won a race yet, whereas the other three are yeah. proven winners. But I think... People are kind of underestimating Gibbs, especially with how consistent he's been this season. So something we have to really watch for. It re- ultimately feels like any of those Gibbs cars could win. Um, so I, I put out my article on betting pros on Wednesday night, yesterday night, and I I didn't have this outright on there now then, but, but I, I kind of panic bought it. I, I saw it come back up to five to one. It was down at four and a half, four to one. Most books, Denny Hamlin's five to one right now, uh, as of Thursday night on DraftKings. that's a price I'm willing to take, man. Like Denny Hamlin was just so far better in a way than everyone that I looked at in my metrics this week. Number one in the Richmond next gen total speed rankings, number one in the short flat track total speed rankings. It's also taking Phoenix into consideration. He won. He won at Bristol, which we saw a lot of high tire wear was a unit here um, at Phoenix as well. Despite an 11th place finish number four in the total speed rankings. I think Denny Hamlin is very live to win. And I, I made a mistake by not getting on him at five to one at Bristol I think he's going to get in that second group in qualifying. I think he'll qualify inside the top 10. I think we see this number maybe four and a half or so. So um, I think anything five to one or better on Hamlin this week, you should be taking. Absolutely. 100% agree with that. Just because Hamlin's history, as we mentioned earlier in the show, is really quite incredible. Just Richmond is one of his tracks. Joe Gibbs racing equipment. He won at Bristol, led a lot of laps at Phoenix. I think it's a no-brainer, and that's about, I think, as best as you might get for, with Hamlin unless somehow he just fumbles it in qualifying. It's, it's yeah, or or he somehow chokes it away like he did uh, at Phoenix and spins out in front of the field. But, yeah, f- finished second here um, last uh, last fall and then 20th, uh, w- which kind of ha- had just a bad run here um, last spring. No way to cut it, but Toyota was kind of dealing with a lot of those body issues. And then a fourth, a first, a second, a second. The guy's up there, man. I, I like Hamlin a lot this week. My other outright here this week, Sean, I, I think 12 to 1 on William Byron is just fucking disrespectful. That is a really disrespectful price. And like I know the finishes necessarily haven't been there for William Byron. Um, but as we noted earlier, like the guy, his average starting position in the next gen era is 3.75. He's gonna qualify inside that top five, most likely. 
this is going to be probably an eight to one or shorter. I would imagine by the time Sunday comes around, I think 12 to one is a great value. Led a shit ton of laps here last year, finished high in the stages. Just has had some bad luck here in the finishes. Didn't run great in the fall, but most of the Chevys tend to not run great in that fall race for whatever reason. Um, give him a night race, give William Byron under the lights. I think he has a chance to go back to back here. I think there's a fair chance in that. And with that that price, I would consider taking a shot at that too. I also want to take the opportunity to mention about the RFK cars with their yeah. outrights, plus 1,300 for BK and then plus 1,500 for uh, Chris Busher there being the Absolutely. best possible obs. I would definitely take that too. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Elliot, Elliot over on the site, he's on Busher as well. Um a, a couple interesting numbers on Busher. I found him top forward on ESPN Bet. ESPN Bet, listen. So they they were having like really not not a lot of NASCAR offerings until the North Carolina launch a couple of weeks ago. ESPN Bet starting to throw some out. They're not on a lot of these uh, odds boards that you kind of see take a lot of different ones from di from different uh, books. But check out ESPN Bet plus three fifty for Busher. That was behind both Keselowski. And Ryan Blaney, Busher to me should be the favorite for top forward. So at three and a half to one, I'll take him there. Uh, also, like keep in mind, man, like Chris Busher, as you kind of referred to, like not only did he win this race last fall, he finished second at Phoenix, man. He finished second at Phoenix. That's one of our close comp tracks, three straight top tens coming into it. I like Busher a lot uh, for that top forward at plus 350. And then William Byron, plus 310 for the top Chevy. These are markets I usually don't explore that much, Sean, but I thought with the top 10 market and top five market being so juiced that looking at the top manufacturer, especially when you know, like with the Chevys, it's probably Byron or, or Larson. And with the Fords, you probably know it's RFK or it's Blaney. Yeah, pretty much. I'd say that's uh, very accurate, especially when you consider the equipment level this week. I think for the Fords, it's really just RFK versus Blaney, I'd say, are the main considerations. Yeah. But unless you want to really rely on the sleeper picks being the SHR cars. Yes, yes. A anything else for you in, uh, in outrights that you're considering getting down or have gotten down on already or in the placement props? There are a couple that I am considering, like if I was going to go a little deeper, I mm -hmm. would maybe consider Ross Chastain at plus 2200, just because okay. I think outside of Byron and Larson, he is the best Chevy dr driver in this field, field as it is. You could also say the same if Alex Bowman nails his setup, he's at plus 5000. Chase Briscoe and Josh Berry both have super deep odds, especially when you consider that four car, Josh Berry. Harvick won in that car not too, too long ago yeah. in 2022. So yeah. you do have to keep that in mind. And he is plus 10,000 as the highest possible odds you can get on him. And Ch Chase Briscoe, he's plus 8,000 at Caesars in order to outright win. I would maybe consider throwing a buck on that at least. Okay. Yeah. You, you would love my co-host Elliot. Cause he, he, he has a couple of those guys highlighted, um, in his article on the website that, uh, he, he likes Barry a lot this week as well. So, um, some Josh Barry love, I, I love to see it. Um, in the placement props, only thing I haven't mentioned is I'm okay with drinking the juice on William Byron top 10. It's minus 154. You're, you're paying some, some premium there, but I just kind of wanted to hedge myself a little bit on some of these longer numbers on Byron. So I, I thought minus 154 on Bet Rivers was a bit of a value when he's minus 220, minus 250 on other books. So I'm drinking a little juice there. I didn't get down on the busher, but but he's like top 10, minus 140 as well. I, I don't know if he'll qualify that well, so I'd probably wait on that one. Um, but I was interested in that a little bit as well. Um, anything else replacement props for you here in Cup? As far as the top five and top 10 bets are concerned, yeah. I'm going to say that this will be an interesting week that if you wanted to do a, a three-legged parlay for a top 10s, you should maybe consider doing that for something like three of the four Gibbs cars in particular, that I like the idea of that personally. Like you get Hamlin, Bell, and Truex to all finish top 10. Heck, maybe even finish top five. I think that could be a very interesting parlay in order to try out. But there's also a couple of other top 10 bets that I am looking on that look very interesting to me. 
Alex Bowman at plus 165 as his eye mm-hmm. sods here. Chase Briscoe, as mentioned, plus 225 on DraftKings Sportsbook. For a top 10, Josh Berry's plus 300. For the highest possible uh, odds there on uh, Caesars for a top 10. Okay. Yeah, there, there's a couple here. Or even if you really want to get deeper with the top 10s, one driver that I think I might take a chance on or consider taking a chance on is John Hunter Nemechek. His highest top 10 odds is plus 425. So Wow. Okay. Yeah, not not a bad number for JHN for sure. We, we shared a little bit of JHN love earlier in the show. I have nothing right now for matchups or groups. Um, that's something I, I, I strongly consider after practice and qualifying. We usually see a, a strong line movement in there. Was there anything that, that you saw that caught your eye here um, before P's and Q's? Uh, as far as the uh, matchup th- or head-to-head bets are concerned, yeah. I'm not really going to be looking at doing many of them until after practice. Yeah, yeah. But, so I'm with you there, but there is one that I did find a little interesting, and that's the Martin Truex Jr. versus Ty Gibbs bet with Ty Gibbs being plus 100. I might consider that one. If that okay. Right. Yeah, I, I, I saw that out there as well, and it's so hard for me to want to bet any of these like top, top, uh joe gibbs racing toyotas man because because they all feel so even this week like I-, I could literally see them anyway finishing one through four but like if i did have to rank those guys as we kind of did like i i would definitely probably put truex ahead of gibbs but at, at pl- you know even money there you know i could consider gibbs for sure um i want to move to the specials and to other series uh and talk about xfinity a little bit this week because I think Chandler Smith, dude, is just like, I think he's the hammer here, man. I think he's the hammer. I got him at plus 330 on ESPN bet. That was the best I could find him outright. I also got him top three, minus 125 at Bet Rivers. Like, Chandler Smith was easily the best driver at Richmond last year in Xfinity series. And also, he was in colleague equipment. Like, he was in not as good equipment. Now he's in a Toyota. He's in great equipment. And in addition to that, like we even saw him in the cup series at Richmond last year, dude, he finished 17th. Like this guy has something about him. He loves his track. I, I, I want him anyway. I can get him. I also have him over Justin Allgaier here, minus minus one thirty five. Like I'm drinking a little juice there, but then also to go like on the outright full unit, like l- lay up Chandler Smith this, this week. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, but I, I, I'm, I'm there with this kid. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with you that if I had to pick one driver in order to win in the Xfinity level, it would have to be Chandler Smith. He dominated at this tr- track when he won before. He's in Gibbs racing equipment. Gibbs is about as good as you could get in the Xfinity series oh, there. The only yeah. other teams that really compare are maybe Stuart Haas or, or J- Junior Motorsports, really. Maybe yeah. even you can make an argument for Colic on some tracks there too, but yeah. really Gibbs, I think, is the class of the field. RCR might be in contention too, potentially, yeah. which makes me want to consider maybe throwing a little bit on an Austin Hill that maybe a plus 1400 on DraftKings yes. outright win. But ultimately, I have the most confidence in Chandler Smith. Maybe yeah. the second t- driver that I'd like, if I had to pivot off of Smith, it might be Cole Custer at plus 500. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cole Custer and Smith, both, both really good at Phoenix earlier this season as well. Um, keep in mind, Cole Custer won Phoenix, one of our closest comp tracks at the championship race last year. And I like what Chandler Smith did at Phoenix too. Like that's the closest comp here, especially in an Xfinity car. I like him quite a bit this week. Um, and staying in the Xfinity series, you mentioned him. I think this is my favorite hammer of all time in the Xfinity series. I went two units down on it. I just couldn't help myself. I'm going to be honest. Maybe that's a little greedy. I went in the Xfinity series on Caesar Sportsbook, plus 210, Austin Hill to win Group C. This is who he's matched up against, Sean. Taylor Gray making his first Xfinity series start. Good equipment. Good equipment. Joe Gibbs Racing equipment. Good-ass equipment. Plus 240 for Taylor Gray. Sammy Smith. I don't know, man. Sammy Smith's just kind of been like mid all year. You know what I mean? Like Sammy Smith hasn't had a, a, a lot of great runs this season so far. Um, looking at what he did specifically last year at this track, he uh, 
he finished in 19th. Like, I don't know, man. Sammy Smith, I, I think Hill can beat him. And then Bubba Pollard is the other guy in this uh, this group. Bubba Pollard is a short track specialist, runs a lot of late model uh, cars for, uh, for Junior over there. He's going to be in that number 88 car. First Xfinity start, though. He ran one ARCA car this year. And before that, like, it's been years and years since he's ever done anything close to an Xfinity car, never done an Xfinity car. So you're getting arguably who I, I think is the top series in the Xfinity driver, Austin Hill, five for five uh, with top fives this season here, Sean. He's going up against two guys who've never raced in the series and Sammy Smith, who's mid. Like, I, I don't know, man. I I, I I was running. I was running to it. I couldn't believe my eyes. Yeah, I think out of all the, all those drivers you mentioned, I think Hill would be the smart bet overall in order to p- play. The only one that I think could have a bit of a case is just Bubba Pollard because of his short track racing background. Everyone it's, loves Bubba Pollard, but, you're right. But I still would take Austin Hill over Pollard this week just because overall, even if the 88 is JRM equipment, it's not going to be the best JRM car. They're going to save the best stuff for Justin Allgaier, if anything, more than that or maybe even Sam Mayer at this rate. So, yeah, I, I trust Hill a bit more because he is the lead driver over at RCR. He's got more support, I'm I'm pretty sure, I'm going to say. Yeah, you can also get him for a top five in Xfinity, like plus 180. But to me, I thought, I don't think he needs a, a top five to beat these guys. I think he needs like a top eight, a top seven, because I think Bubba Pollard, you're right, is probably the... The, like Bo Pollard's a fun bet. If you want to fucking bet sweat out on Saturday during midday, uh, Bo Pollard plus two seventy five is probably the guy. But I, dude, I just think Austin Hill. Like unless a piano drops from the sky, this guy's gonna be a top eight car. I don't think these other guys will be. Yeah, I, I'm gonna have to agree with you there, Seth. The logic uh, and all the stats are pointing that way. <laughs> Any anything else for you? Any other markets, whether that's Xfinity Cup, anything we haven't touched on this weekend, Sean, that you're liking out there that we haven't uh, shown some love to? I'm going to say overall that although we've named a lot of these bets, I think we're going to really get the best idea of what else to go for after this once we get through practice and qualifying okay. because that's really going to be the big factor in determining thing, you know, starting position and start position is a bit of a big deal because it's a shorter track. You start too far in the back, even if you have a good car, you might end up going a lap down early on and then it's going to be very hard to catch up from there and that could really affect the the whole bet betting market right there as far as who to take yeah it, you know sometimes you do get like the chris busher like we talked about last year where he started deep in the field but sometimes you start deep in the field and like you play funny games and and, and shit happens you know and, and so you got to keep that in mind we saw it happen earlier this season even at some short tracks early wrecks in the races so Sean, I, I can't thank you enough for being here with us tonight on the back road as we bring in Richmond, which will be an exciting weekend, our second short track of the season. Uh, tell us, the IBT family, man, where we can support you and how we can uh, best find all your content here in the 2024 NASCAR season. Well, you can find all my written content mainly at fantasyguru.com. I am one of the lead NASCAR writers there. I usually cut for the Cup Series races every week. I also go into Fantasy Guru Discord, throw out a lot of bets, give DFS advice out, answer questions live. You can go over there. You can get the MVP All Access Pass in order to get access to all the NASCAR content over the, there and uh, amongst all other sports as well. And you can also find some of my stuff over at Rotoballer where, where I might do an occasional quick hit or two. I cover a lot of news previews and outlooks, giving uh, some of my impressions and overall views of how I think some drivers might perform before the ra- race overall, usually each and every week. So you can go and find my stuff there. You can follow me at Sean E247. It's right here, as you see it all spelled out very nicely. And from there, you can just follow me and know everything I'm doing from there. 
Awesome. Well, Sean, we greatly appreciate you, man. Your father is a gentleman. He is a scholar. You are as well. So we greatly appreciate you being here. As for the IBT family, guys, make sure you're heading over there to Twitter, following Sean and uh, all his great NASCAR content for the season. And make sure you're plugged in here at IBT Media as well. As we said, we got a long, long list of uh, items coming for you here in the month of April. So make sure you're subscribed, hanging out with us as we're here on the back road every Thursday night, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. Don't forget about the NASCAR betting preview show on Wednesdays on the channel as well. And all the clips in between um, guys have a great Richmond. Make sure you're keeping up with us on the socials, on the betting pros app. So you can know what we're getting down on ahead of the race um, until next time. Keep it in between and have a great weekend. Thanks so much. Y'all have a good one.